Hello everyone, I wish you a good afternoon and a good evening. Welcome to SPAN Virtual Debates 2021 Tournament in Room 10. Our host in this session is Brad Dict, who will be managing the technical aspects of our match. Judd Jim Plasco is the president of the Chicago Society for Space Studies. He's a former vice president and director of the National Space Society. Judge Shana Christensen is the founder of Aerospace Public Policy Institute, responsible for building the first worldwide K-8 public speaking curriculum, in addition to coaching middle school debate and sponsoring the inaugural Toastmakers Youth Leadership Club. Shana is a former SPAN coach. Welcome, I'm, I'm so sorry to interrupt. It seems like there was a bio um, mistake for Shana. Are we... That's okay. It's all right. You can move on. It's all right. Sorry about that. That's all Sorry right. Uh, so judges, um, welcome to the debate. And I would like to ask the judges to stay back after the end of the session for reporting purposes. And I'm your moderator and facilitator for room 10. And my name is Abhinaya. I would like to read the following statement to you. The winning team is chosen based on their skill and effort and not on any preset NSS position. NSS clearly believes that humanity should continue to explore, develop, and settle space. However, NSS also believes that honest and open debate will facilitate that goal. It's important that space advocates understand and be able to express the anti-space case. No statement by any debater or coach is an official position of NSS. Let's meet our debaters. Tim Endoya is named after the space boat in Norway. Tim Endoya, please give your name and the country you're representing. I'm Valentina Manasalva and I'm from Peru. I'm Fajichata and I'm representing the United Arab Emirates. I'm Denis Bart and I'm from Romania. I am Andrei Marin and I'm from Romania. Thank you, Tim Andaya. Team Satish Dhawan carries the name of the space boat in India. Please give us your name and the country you're representing. Hello, everyone. My name is Annie and I'm, I'm from China. Hello, everyone. My name is Tapas and I'm from India. Hello, my name is Edward and I'm from Romania. Hello, everyone. My name is Stephanie and I'm from Peru. Thank you, Team Satish Dhawan. If anybody has a question, please raise your hand in your icon on your screen. Please mute your mic unless you're speaking and only the presenting team and judges should turn on their videos unless directed by the moderator. Our debate format today follows the same format as June 11, 2021. All right, Mr. Dict, do we have only the judges and the affirmative team with live video and mics? Yes, we do. We're ready to go. Okay, let's get started. We'll hear from the first speaker from Team Andoya representing the affirmative position for the resolution. Space traffic management should be regulated by the UN Security Council. Team Andoya, your first speaker may begin your affirmative intro. You have three minutes. Fellow opponents, fellow judges, today I'm going to make the introduction for the affirmative team Andoya. The resolution states that spacefaring should be regulated by the United Nations Security Council. The affirmative, the affirmative team finds this solution highly effective for two main reasons. The UNSC is a very good regulator and this kind of regulation is necessary even in the short run. First of all, the regulation is highly necessary for expanding our space presence, which is very beneficial for the human species. Regulation refers to preventing the accumulation of space junk, preventing space wars, and also accidents. We'll compare space regulation with regulations in other human activities to emphasize on its necessity. For example, we will show you how space debris can induce terrestrial problems apart from the Kessler syndrome in space. L.J. Edmonds and Seth Baker indicated as critical points our future commitment to asteroid mining, colonization, and increasing communication. Their paper introducing universalization also threatens us about the risk of increasing military presence in outer space. The common denominator is that space affairs will become intertangled with the terrestrial ones. Therefore, we cannot let space traffic unregulated, as, as this will bring havoc both in space and on Earth. Not regulating space traffic management will also allow the ongoing decrease in available radio frequencies and orbits to continue unhindered. We don't, want, we don't want to use these precious resources for unrewarding purposes, given that we might not be able to communicate here on Earth if we run out of radio frequencies. 
Also, not having a place for important satellites might slow us in fighting climate change, as we will lack valuable scientific data obtained from space. Secondly, the UNSC is very qualified. All five permanent members participate in space programs, proving they have the necessary experience in this field. The UNSC can also gather scientists and other experts to create proper rules through its numerous partnerships. It's well known that cooperation is better than negotiation. UNSC is also very representative. Since the non-permanent members of the UNSC change every two years, any country may have a say in space-related decisions, even if it doesn't have a space program. This mechanism promotes universalization as it leads to global consensus on a global issue. We believe there are no better organizations for regulating STM than the Security Council, because space is a critical infrastructure for the human species, giving the advantages and the technological spin-offs we have from it, as well as the risks coming from it. Moreover, in case of a terrestrial emergency, space will be the only opportunity to preserve human life. Terrestrial security depends on having a secure space. To close it up, mind that any kind of traffic requires regulation. Space exploration is no exception. Space exploration is one of our noblest endeavors, and we don't want it to become an arena for wars, which are the most abject part of human nature. We also don't want to destroy our planet due to an accident or a space war, but rather use space to solve its problems, such as climate change. On the way to solving our issues Antoia, through space exploration. Your time is up. Thank you. Thank you. Speaker negative one from team Satish Tavan. Please give your three minute intro. Greetings, ladies and gentlemen. We are group Satish Dawin, and we will talk about why the space traffic unit management should not be regulated by the UNSC. In recent years, with the development of science and technology, human beings have focused on space, built rockets and space shuttles, and set out for the vast universe. As time goes on, more and more countries launch rockets into space, and space order has become a topic of discussion. It has been suggested that the UNSC should take over the management of safe space traffic, but we do not think it is a wise decision. First, let's look at what the UNSC is. The UNSC, often known as the United Nations Security Council, is composed of 15 countries, of which five are permanent members, China, the United States, Russia, France, and the United Kingdom. The national strengths of these countries are very strong. If they are in charge of space traffic management, there will be a lot of problems. At the same time of exploration of space, the world is also becoming a whole, which we often call globalization. The universalization after that requires us to unite as one and prosper together. When exploring outer space, if we let the UN Security Council take charge of space traffic management, it will undoubtedly make the goal of unity more difficult. The structure of the Security Council determines that all the resolutions adopted by the Security Council are beneficial to the diplomatic interests of these five permanent members at the same time, because each permanent member has one vote of veto. If a resolution of the Security Council is not beneficial to a permanent member, there is no reason for that country to let the resolution be passed. As long as one permanent member uses the veto, any resolution is beneficial to these five countries. In general, the interests of other countries will not be considered. Now, let me introduce our group. Tapas will talk about how the principle of universalization could be put at risk if the UNSC regulates space traffic. Eddie will talk about the harm of the UN Security Council in managing space order to small countries and who we think should be in charge of space traffic management. Stephanie will make a summary of the debate. The universe is the farthest place that human beings can explore now. We should work together to make every country speak. Finally, we state our superior again. Space traffic management should not be regulated by UNSC. Thank you. Uh, thank you, team. Uh, let's hear from Affirmative 2 from Team Andoya for the beginning three minute argument. Universalization is the way to reach truly global society, and this requires cooperation. A necessary field of cooperation must be effective management of space traffic through the UNSC. You might be asking if we really require STM regulation. The answer is simple, yes, because without regulation, we risk a forced toll of any space mission. Regulation is required for any kind of traffic. For example, it prevents vehicles from crashing into each other. However, in space, the risk is even bigger. 
a space junk could cause the Kessler syndrome. When collisions between space debris, hugely increase the number of dangerous fragments until we can't launch any more space missions. Clearing space debris as a group is a perfect example of applied universalization, as well as a form of preventing space wars already highlighted by the UN themselves. A result of these space wars can result in a wastage of precious materials and also cause the creation of more space debris and other catastrophic implications stated by the Egyptian representative on the UN meeting coverage and press releases. By making the USU responsible for the STM, junk removal included, we can prevent both space wars and the Kessler syndrome. Space debris also threatens terrestrial life. These debris occasionally enter the atmosphere and the bigger ones fall on Earth. Around each year, 40,000 metric tons of space debris are hurled towards the Earth. The falling debris could land in human populated areas, causing fatalities in the thousands. On May 18th of 2021, a Chinese rocket body fell to the Earth. The Guardian highlighted this. They warned that the pieces which broke off could knock a plane out of the sky. Although it is, it is physically impossible to stop debris falling because of its high velocity. In order to prevent such injuries and deaths from, falling, uh, from debris falling to Earth, we should control the amount of junk orbiting the Earth and remove as much as possible. Debris could also impact us indirectly by denying us vital satellites such as GPS, communication satellites, and monitoring climate change. There is no need to tell you that all of us will suffer if we can't use satellites anymore. There are already multinational attempts to mitigate these risks. The European Space Agency plans to commission the world's first successful space removal. This should be launched by 2025. It relies on nets and magnets to capture floating pieces of debris. By reducing the risk of space junk removal, it could also implement moral responsibility of debris left in the orbit. For these great benefits, we require global regulation from the most legitimate institution, the UNSC. Not having effective global regulation of the SDM means in the long run, having no space exploration. Thank you. Thank you, team. Uh, now we'll have a one minute silent break. Time's up. Negative two from team Satish Tavan. Please give your beginning arguments and respond to affirmative two arguments. You have a six minute allotment. The need for space traffic management is growing at a phenomenal rate in recent times. Space exploration in the future will be governed by the efficiency of space traffic management today. The laws we set forward today will not be a gradual engineering of existing space laws, but a big bang, as in the law of the sea, which includes the transfer of all the current legal provisions, treaties, and regulations into one coherent and comprehensive text. The United Nations Security Council must not govern space traffic, since this would put the future of humanity's curiosity at risk. The UNSC comprises 15 members, of which five are permanent. These five permanent nations have the most abundant resources disposable for the benefits of their space program. If UNSC is given the authority to make crucial decisions regarding space affairs, the nations with solid space programs would dominate. They wouldn't potentially allow other countries to compete with them. Also, large corporations would dominate over smaller startups, 
making a once healthy competition now un un unethical. We will also have to devise laws and make multiple bodies responsible for governance. Combining public, private, and universal laws and many other global organizations would solve the existing online problems regarding space traffic management. Keeping the principle of universalization in mind, promoting cooperation between human species beyond Earth is essential for missions beyond Earth. If UNSC handles operations relating to space, the homogeneous principle that underlies beneath would be broken. In order to promote cooperation between humans in space, it is essential that multiple bodies cooperate and regulate space traffic, prevent the permanent nations of UNSC from creating a monopoly. I would like to bring everyone's attention to perhaps the most important argument so far. UNSC comprises of 15 member nations, which is less than a quarter of the total number of countries that exist on our planet. I, Tapas, would like to remind the affirmative side that the era of globalization is almost over and the era of universalization is about to begin. The principle of universalization calls upon member nations to cooperate and understand each other. Affirmative side, how do you expect the nations not a part of the Security Council to voice their opinions and gather support for the missions into space? This brings me back to the fundamental argument of our team, Satish Dhawan. The UNSC shall not be the sole body managing space traffic management, keeping in mind the homogeneous principles of universalization, which tell us to promote cooperation universally to enable humans to thrive anywhere in the universe by staying united together. Thank you. Thank you, team. Uh, now we'll have a one minute silent break. Time's up. Affirmative two of Andoya now returns for a three minute response to negative two. You have three minutes. Highlighting the negative argument of space exploration, this needs regulation only the UNSC can achieve. The UNSC is a first reacting branch in the UN. Besides this, it's five permanent members, which are space powers. It has 10 permanent members who bring representativity to this institution. Till 1965, there were only six non-permanent members, but we can see that this organization underwent reform since its formation after the Second World War. The 10 non-permanent members are chosen through secret ballots by the UN General Assembly, which represents almost every country here on Earth, being irrefutably the most representative organization. Nonetheless, the 10 seats are shared between geographic regions, so it ensures universalization. We have five members from Asia, two from Africa, and Asia and Africa, two from Latin America, one from Eastern Europe and two from Western Europe, and some from other regions. Other countries outside of the UN can also have a say in different conflicts that need to be resolved. We see that this, from, this reparation is irrespective of wealth, but rather than population, so it proves equitable. Thank you. Thank you, team. Now let's have a cross examination for, for four minutes. From We will hear from affirmative one and two and negative one and two. And Andoya will begin the cross. Team Andoya? 
is there any major unregulated transportation transportation system here on earth uh yes i uh, think the best uh organization on earth is UNOSA because it contains like almost every country on earth which could cooperate together and make regulations for space traffic management yes uh I what I asked is if there is any major unregulated transportation st system here on Earth. Tapas, do you have something to say? So, see, when you talk about transportation that's unregulated, space exploration that is rock launching rockets from ground to space majorly includes that. So that is the reason why we believe that uh, launching rockets from uh, here on ground to space should not be regulated by UNSC, but rather by uh, an organization that takes into account all of the nation's beliefs, ideas, and views, and compares it with one coherent uh, belief system that suits and benefits all of them. Also, I got a question for the affirmative side. So the affirmative side has spoken a lot on space debris, and they have majorly cited as to why the United Nations Security Council needs to govern space traffic management in order to solve the space debris issue. But here's the thing, what exactly has the Security Council actually done uh, to remove the space debris or to solve the issue of the problem? Well, uh, space debris is a security concern and the Security Council deals with this type of issues. Uh, yes, so well, far, what so exactly far it has... Oh, okay, so, uh, well, firstly, uh, the UNOSA has been managing for a year already of space and UNSC can prove itself to be a good choice, even the best choice for STM because it has no experience. And also I have a question for the affirmative side. Uh, what is the relationship between UNSC and STM? How is it beneficial to have as UNSC, uh, UNSC managing STM? Because I didn't hear much about it. Well, so far the UNSC was not responsible for this type of issues. So we cannot give a relevant example. And three of the five major powers of the UNSC have a developed a very developed space program. So that's where they have the experience from. Uh, they also have um, history, research, and textbook as physical evidence and individual experts from each country that can support the case of developing space, developing materials to get rid of space debris. Uh, also, I have another question for the affirmative side. Uh, so what if a country outside the UN Security Council has a conflict about STM with a country that belongs to the UN Security Council? Because I believe that not every country will consider about other countries. So what do you think of that? Well, every country can participate in the meetings and have a say in what they need to do. And hence, through those UNSC meetings, they can um, sort out what, they, what the conflicts they have between each other and hopefully cooperate. Themes, your time's up. Uh, let's hear from affirmatively from Kim and Doya for your remaining argument. You have three minutes. I will present you several arguments why we truly need space traffic management and we need the UN Security Council to rule it in order to improve and maintain our life standards here on Earth. For example, right now, we are having an example of universalization. We communicate. And in order to communicate, we require wireless internet. We require satellites. And those satellites use radio frequencies. Radio frequencies are available in a limited number. If you overlap them, we have interference. Our atmosphere does not allow any frequency for communication. So we have only a very limited number, which in the long run may deplete. And then 
how will we choose to uh, manage those frequencies? Will we assign them to space missions? Will we assign them to terrestrial communications? We are on the verge of, on, of a conflict between space and Earth. And the only way to avoid this conflict is through regulation. Also, we have a problem when, in when it comes to sharing orbits, because we require orbits for multiple purposes, and certain valuable orbits are in very limited number. And if we use them for wrong purposes, then how will we launch our satellites, which are truly important, such as satellites monitoring climate change or satellites giving location here on Earth? This is a very important issue that should be regulated by a truly international organization, such as the United Nations Security Council. We need an organization that already exists to solve this problem. We cannot afford to create a new organization without knowing what will it consist of. Also, ITU radio regulation recommend us to manage these frequencies so as to preserve several free ones. And in order to assign a global community, such as radio frequencies, we have to use a global institution. And this is the United Nations Security Council. Now, in order to bring universalization in this, let's think a little bit about the overview effect, the effect that ast astronauts feel when they orbit Earth. They see it as a whole, not as a bunch of disparate countries, not wars, but a whole planet with global issues. And this kind of overview effect is what we want. This overview effect promotes cooperation between states, and we should use it. And the best way to use it is in the United Nations Security Council, where every country gets a say. Every country gets elected there, apart from the permanent members, for some reasons. And one of these reasons could be performance in space exploration. Therefore, we consider that this organization is truly democratic, as countries can represent both state and private interest. And to thank you. Kim, your time is up. Now let's have a one minute silent break. Time up. Negative three from Satish Savan. Please give your remaining arguments and response to affirmative three in your six minute allotment. We have all wondered what our lives will be like after we start living outside Earth's atmosphere. We fear the struggle, the failure, and the danger. We hope for the best. Still, it is all a long way down the road. Space traffic management is one of the most important things when it comes to the safety of human lives. That is exactly why we have to give the honor of controlling it to a capable council that can handle the difficulties encountered. We are talking about difficulties like the debris that can destroy rockets and rogue countries that can destroy futures. It has been suggested that the United Nations Security Council should regulate space traffic management. We do not agree with that statement and I'll tell you why. It is because it would create a very powerful authority governed by the biggest countries on Earth, which would disregard smaller and less meaningful countries. These big strengths on Earth could rule space with the power they would get. UNSC consists of five permanent members. They, these are also the greatest military powers on Earth. An example of a possible organization that could regulate space traffic would be the UNOOSA, which is the United Nations Office for Outer Space Affairs, promoting international cooperation in the peaceful use of outer space. 
From this organization, we can rescue that it carries out international workshops, training courses, and pilot projects on topics that include remote sensing, satellite navigation, satellite meteorology, teleeducation, and basic space science for the benefit of developing countries. Therefore, no country is excluded from the space issue. UNOSA also prepares and distributes reports, studies, and publications on various fields of space science, space applications, and international space law. This demonstrates that this council has the necessary knowledge to handle STM. We have seen in 2017 how the UNSC failed to defend one of the little countries, Syria. Over 400,000 of the Syrian people had been killed, over 5 million became refugees, and over 6.3 million were internally displaced. The conflict began on 15th of March 2011 with demonstrations. These demonstrations were like demonstrations held in other Arab countries, which has been called the Arab Spring. Protesters in Syria demanded that President Bashar al-Assad resign. After months of military battles, the protests turned into an armed rebellion. The council failed to prevent and then failed to respond. The dynamics on the ground and in New York have never been conducive to any meaningful action, either before or after the fact. Do you think that this disaster would have happened to a big, important, permanent UNSC member like France? More than likely, it would have not. On a more recent note, according to reports, the conflict between the Palestinian armed forces and Israel is turning into an all-out war. The UN Special Envoy for the Middle East said that the United Nations is communicating and cooperating with all parties so that peace can be restored at an early date. The situation between Palestine and Israel continues to be tense, and the United States vetoes the peace proposal. According to French media, the UN Security Council had an emergency meeting on 12th in response to the worsening situation of the current Palestinian-Israeli conflict. The meeting discussed the Palestinian-Israeli conflict and attempted to adopt a joint statement aimed to easing the situation in the region. However, due to opposition of the United States, the statement was not adopted. According to reports, 14 of the 15 members of the UN Security Council attending the meeting agreed with the statement. The UN side said that the Security Council meeting itself is enough to arouse people's attention and that only one joint statement is of no help to Palestinian-Israeli conflict situation. To sum up, USA's veto another decision that other 40 members were for. In principle, we are talking about human lives and their safety in this process. Do we really want to risk our future in space? I think most people would agree that working together, all countries on Earth united, taking universalization into account is more important than risking a dominating force beyond Earth. Thank you. Thank you, team. Now we'll have a one minute silent break. Time's up. Affirmative plea of Andoya now returns for a three minute response to negative three. I will begin by saying that the examples presented by the negative team for PUNSC not being effective in mitigating terrestrial conflict are simply not relevant because ever since the war, Second World War, we didn't have any major conflict here on Earth. Yes, they may, may have been several mistakes, several important mistakes, but in the big picture, we don't have any world war ongoing today. Moreover, the UNSC pr has permanent members which have experience and from this experience then can result good decisions. Also, this experience applies when it comes to universalization. In the 
Security Council, we have France as a permanent member, but France also participates in the European Space Agency, which is the first example of universalization applied to space affairs, because this organization wants to, prom to remove space debris in a multinational attempt, and this is a very good thing to do. We should apply this on a global scale, and the European Space Agency is just a mere example to start. The negative team proposed an alternative for the United Nations Security Council. They presented the UNOSA. Well, this organization has indeed a purpose when it comes to space affairs, but its purpose is to apply rules dictated by the United Nations General Assembly and by other organizations responding to the UN. And this makes them very good in elaborating detailed policies, but not necessarily in enforcing them, and especially not when it comes to taking decisions on a very rapid basis. For example, the, the space war or simply a space accident requires an immediate response, and the United Nations organization responsible for rapid responses is the Security Council, which has to take very rapid decisions. Their organization can be a very good auxiliary for UNSC, but it cannot be led to enforce space policies because they simply have no mechanism to do this. The United Nations Security Council can enforce sanctions, has a very high prestige. It represents through elections every country here on earth. Therefore, it is the more democratic way to do this. Because if you take the UNOSA, we see that we have a technocratic approach. But does a technocratic approach truly bring universalization? We cannot be led simply by scientists and pretend that them represent everybody here on Earth. We have to use democracy for this. And the only organization that has democracy is the UN General Assembly, which chooses the UN Security Council. Every non-permanent member gets there on a vote, and that gives them the right to enforce space policies. Thank you. Thank you, team. Let's hear from affirmative three and four and negative three and four in the second four-minute cross-examination. Satish Davan, the negative position, will begin the cross. Okay. First of all, I want to start that deaths are deaths, and no one can minim minimize a problem solely by the number of deaths. If something like this happened in the space, will they just not take into account because it is not relevant for them because they are big victims. Traveling to the space is already very dangerous and we admire people who risk their life for it. For a different reason, everyone deserves to have a security that nothing will pass them off the ground. If we have an incident happening in space, then people on Earth are responsible for managing it, that is for sure. But even if this incident does not involve a major space power, we have common interests, we have alliances, and these alliances are the mechanism that supports UNSC in taking the best decisions. For example, I presented France. France can answer both for itself, but for the, also for the European Space Agency, just to give an example. I also wanted to ask you something. Um, so the UNSC consists of five permanent members and other 10 non-permanent members. The five permanent members have, have vetoes that have been frequently used in history. These vetoes annul every decision. How do you think the other non-permanent members can change something if the permanent members do not agree with it? First of all, we need rules for space traffic management. You can use veto to deny something, but you still have to impose a certain policy at a certain time. And those non-permanent members are twice the number of permanent members. So when we will have to vote a set of rules for space policy, then those non-permanent members will dominate the discussion because they simply are more. And to ask to answer you why won't a veto be used because the major powers will have the interest of having rules major powers suffer as well as minor powers from the kessler syndrome for example i would like to ask you how do you want the 
UN OSA to impose the rules they establish, for example, if a country simply doesn't want to comply with them? What mechanism will it use? Well, we think of the UN OSA as a democratic council that uh, would put a, uh, every decision to a vote. So uh, every little country would have uh, would, could vote uh, when it comes to a decision and uh, not just the uh, powerful forces on earth. I understand also that. Also, they but... from UNGA. And also, we cannot give all the power to an organization like the UN Security Council. So it's, it is very likely that the leading countries of this country do not take into account. Those are still developing and much less share their discoveries of technology technological advances with them. It can also be the case where they benefit themselves from the rules that they can implement, which will be a new problem that will be generated. What do you think about that? I think that the UN Security Council is the only institution that can apply its rules because it's not enough to have rules. States have rules decided by parliaments, but they also have the judiciary branch in order to ensure that everybody respects the rules. We need the same separation when it comes to space. We need somebody to make the rules and we need to enforce them somehow. You present a method to enforce Please the rules. Time is up. Enforce. Thank you. Uh, we'll have a two minute silent break at this time. Time's up. Affirmative four from team Andoya will begin the summary in the four minute allotment. Let's first talk about regulation. Affirmative strategy that the best way to prevent accidents, space wars, and make the traffic smoother, as well as to reduce the traffic times, resources consumption, and pollution is through regulation. This concept has been proved indispensable for any other kind of traffic and concern on Earth, so it is also necessary in space. As everybody based to the same set of rules, we can anticipate what the other is going to do. This will help us to prevent overlapping of the space assets. Furthermore, as my teammates and previously mentioned, regulation is also essential for the use of our orbits. Due to the great amount of space missions, our orbits could deplete. Moreover, space debris could, use, could cause accidents affecting critical space missions, such as those monitoring climate change. In addition, from the orbit, space debris may re-enter atmosphere and impact so, thus representing an obvious hazard for inhabitants. Therefore, we have to at least try to rewrite space, or all of these problems become inevitable when Kessler syndrome kicks in. 
He says that space debris will also lead to a decrease in available radio frequencies. From there, we might not be able to communicate here on Earth, and I think they don't want that right. On the other hand, the negative side argued that the U.S. Security Council shouldn't be responsible for the space traffic regulation due to it is ineffective, has no experience, and doesn't promote generalization. However, we proved that that statement is wrong. We stated that we need a clear authority responsible for the decision-making process to avoid contradictory decisions made by different agencies. As we want to implement universalization, we should employ a worldwide control agency to represent every country in space affairs. Today, the United Nations Security Council is the most competent body for dealing with space affairs, as it consists of important space powers, but also developing countries. The November, the November the members also even the, allows the, even the countries lacking of a space program having a say in the space related decisions and this clearly promotes universalization. Besides that, as my teammates mentioned, most of the major powers of the UN Security Council have developed space pro programs. So it's clear that they have the necessary experience to deal with these type of issues. When it comes to solving a problem to an institution, one well, of the most important aspects involved is the legitimacy of the institution. The United Nations Security Council benefits from a high degree of trust on the international arena, and before even having to enforce sanctions, its decisions might be respected due to its prestige. The sanctions it may use are not designed to bring, to bring poverty or to deny nice certain countries the right of going to space, but rather to emphasize on the benefits of cooperation and universalization. To summarize, the affirmative side provided a more prudent approach by taking into consideration the importance of regulation in any aspect of our lives, by proving that regulation is essential in order to avoid ending up in a catastrophic situation, and by demonstrating that the U.S. Security Council is the best option for regulating space traffic. Meanwhile, the negative side just stated that the Security Council is ineffective. This suggested that the U.N. OOS a can be responsible for SDM. However, U.S. Security Council is the only agency that can enforce decisions. So in fact, this organization that they are suggesting would be pointless. Furthermore, they didn't fully take regulation into account, even though we have already demonstrated that it is necessary. It seems that they prefer to threaten our space, our own planet and our future, rather than accepting that we need to implement space rules and that the best option for regulating those is the UN Security Council. It does make us confident that we are providing the correct approach to this delicate situation. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, now, negative four delivers the Satish Tavan summary in the four minute allotment. Okay, first of all, I would like to clarify that you said that all nations are part of the UN Security Council, and that's not true. There are only five permanent members that another that are not permanent, that are changing every five years. How do they can be part of something so important like this if they will be changed? And also, I want to add that a country is not the whole world, as you said. Activity in space has increased due to the technological advances of countries in recent decades. But along with these advances that benefit all humanity, a new problem arises: space debris. Since currently our orbit is around of satellites and other objects that accumulate year after year, from this problem arises the need to manage space traffic. And this is where we as a team will pick up our position that an organization like the Office of Our Space Affairs should lead our goal of space traffic management and not the UN Security Council. In this debate, it is argued that the United Nations Security Council should regulate the management of space traffic, but we passionately believe that it should not be the case, since it will be given greater authority to countries with great technological developments, which will not consider the smaller and less developed countries. As my colleagues previously mentioned, if the UN Security Council had all the power and authority exclusively in its hands, nations with solid space programs would dominate. They will develop a new problem where big corporations will dominate the smaller companies that want to progress but cannot because there are no specialized programs for them to learn how to do it, or programs that give them relevant information about space. As we mentioned previously, the UN Security Council is composed of five permanent members who are currently the ones with the greatest military power. For them, we suggest that the UN, the UNOSA be the one that regulates the management of space traffic because it has the technological knowledge to organize the operations. In turn, we consider that in order to achieve efficient management, it must have a regulatory framework and a legal framework that is based on the technological advances and contribute to promoting and guarantee the desired security, sustainability, and stability of space operations. And these characteristics are what make you know, our base option. On the other hand, this same organization promotes international cooperation in the peaceful use of our space. From this organization, we can rescue that it conducts international workshops, training courses, and pilot projects on topics that include remote incessing, satellite navigation, satellite meteorology, teleeducation, and basic space science for the benefit of a developing countries. So any country is going to be excluded. 
UNASA also prepares and distributes reports, studies, and publications on various fields of space science, space application, and international space law. Give all the necessary information and arguments, we can conclude that speaking of space, we cannot exclude any country from developing. So everyone should have the opportunity to have access to relevant information that includes all of us as a future in the planetary race, for which I invite all those present of different nationality to develop critical thinking about the problem and correctly analyze the solution to this problem to all regional organization together, since it is about that we all have access to space in order to develop and expand our horizon. And to finish, let me tell you that the future success of reaching space as a single race, that humanity is not the work of one, it's the work of everyone. Also, I would like to tap us to add more information about it. Yeah, so the affirmative side has uh, spoken about how they believe in universalization, and at the same time, they want the United Nations Security Council to govern STM. Guys, it's like saying you believe in socialism and capitalism at the same time, which isn't technically possible realistically. Thanks. Thank you, team. Your time is up. Uh, the judges now adjourn to the breakout rooms for their deliberation. They have eight minutes, but we encourage you to return soon as, uh, as soon as possible. Thank you. Okay, judges, I'll be putting you into your breakout room. Okay, they are in the breakout room. And we have eight minutes. So teams, you're free to switch on your videos and shake all the stress off. You had a great debate. I really loved it. Um, I just wanted to ask if everybody's all good. Due to the pandemic, there's a lot going on and hope you're fine. I have a little doubt for which I need your opinions. It's like uh, lately we have seen a lot of technology advancement, especially in robots, healthcare robots and stuff like that. We also have a negative side that there might be a robot invasion. How do you think that robots will affect space and what work humans will do in space? or what robots will do there. Any I mean, opinions? Like, I mean, like uh, space is like, has always been considered the final frontier for humans. And like uh, our journey into space is going to open infinite amount of opportunities for like every single human being on the planet. Like we can't even comprehend the number of jobs that will be available to humans once we fully migrate being a space-faring species, as Elon says it, yeah. Yeah, you're completely right. Andre, Annie, anybody else? Sending a robot to space is much cheaper than sending a person. So for any exploration purpose, robots are the best way to go. They also can reach uh, further destination without having problems staying confined in a room for months or years. Yeah, but it's also an ideal that humans are sent to space because we want to continue the human race. So how does it, how can we be friendly with robots or robots will take over us like that robot apocalypse or something like that? Anybody has any opinion? Um, well, to stop things like robot invasions, we'd have to limit the amount of information we give robots or allow them to have access to. Because with things like artificial intelligence, um, it could allow a robot to continuously gain information that it can be able to retain. So we'll either have to limit the information it receives or limit the capacity it has. I think like the future, the dystopian future that like many people of, uh, that many people think is actually quite far away. And honestly speaking, I don't see that coming anytime near in the future because like artificial intelligence too has like different categories. The AI that Google or Facebook or TikTok uses is basically the relevance um, AI that matches your desires, your passions, the posts that you wanna view. And the AI that is actually depicted in Hollywood movies is something kind of self-thinking and you know the evil mindset which isn't really uh, even in its developmental stages today 
So yeah. So we do have hope. Uh, so I would like to ask Frankie, how many of you like robots? Oh uh, yeah, everybody does. And how many ones want to work on them after growing up? Any dreams of developing robots? So what kind of robots do you want to develop? Annie? Well, I actually, I have a special interest in language learning. So it's like in the future, if you want to travel outside, uh, like nowadays, you need to actually ask a person who can speak that language to help you like understand what the others were talking about. But if you have like an artificial intelligence that could actually translate what you are saying, like a ro robot that can accompany you, it will be much less cheaper and convenient for all those travelers in different countries. Hmm. Seems like we'll be able to talk with uh, aliens someday <laughs> if they do exist. That would be fun. Any other opinions on this? Dennis, Valentina, you're free to speak. Okay, probably, um, how, ma how much time do we have left before the judges sign? Uh, three minutes, just about three minutes, 15 seconds. Oh, that's okay, I good. think uh, Dennis is trying to say something. So I was saying that for space mission, like recon missions, and it's way easier for rob it's way easier to send robots. But uh, right now we don't have the the uh, necessary uh, software, and so the technology is not uh, that developed. Uh, if it's all right, uh, Bert, what's your take on this? Oh, yes. Oh, you asking me? Yes. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, I've been a human exploration person for since the days of Apollo. That inspired me to become an engineer. So while I see a lot of pluses to sending robots, uh, robot explorers, and, and in some cases we have to do that, to me, it, nothing compares to sending humanity out there. That's what excites me. And I realize we don't have the technology now because of the distances, the vast distances we'd have to travel to do a lot of certainly interplanetary but, uh, travel, but it's going to get there. We're going to get there. We're going to be on Mars and maybe you as, as uh, uh, the future will help us get there. So that's what I'm looking forward to. <laughs> I wish it could be me, uh, but I think my time has passed, but I think you have so many more opportunities uh, to travel into space than I will have, where you don't have to become a professional astronaut, that you might work as an engineer uh, for a company and the company bu you know, buys a seat on SpaceX and sends you up to do research. So think about those types of things but then also the robotic exploration is critical for us to learn before we send people. So you're gonna see a complementary type of thing. It's a complementary approach. Thank you, Bert. And we've got one minute to go. Great, so now- okay, uh, Just on the lighter side of things, sorry, Abhinaya. So Edward and Dennis here are brothers. Uh, how do you feel going against each other today in this room? Um, well, I don't know. It was a little bit awkward because uh, we've been hard, uh, working very hard, each of us in um, our rooms. And we know uh, we haven't done research together or anything. So we don't know. We, we didn't know anything about each other's arguments. Uh, and it was fun going head to head with, with my brother. Dennis, what would you say? I have the same opinion as my brother that it, it was a bit weird, but also interesting. All of you were fantastic today. So uh, like the yeah. 
I, sorry to interrupt. We're going to need to go back in the breakout room for a few minutes. We were not able to come up with a decision. Oh, Very okay. close. To it, so we're going to need a few more minutes. So great, great debate, but we're, we're still hammering out some issues. Okay. So uh, okay. Uh, let's see. Let me, let me get you back in there. Thank you. Yes. I just wanted to give you a heads up. Okay. Let me see how to, okay. They'll close. I got, it looks like I got to re reopen them. Yeah. Interesting how this works. <laughs> well, you know, it, some of them are much easier to determine. And uh, so right. this is a testament to all of you today uh, that you have, have done a great job, so. I just have to wait till this closes out, Shauna, and then I'll sure. get back, back in. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I'm gonna open all the rooms right now. So I'll get you guys back in and here yeah, you go. Yeah, sorry, Bert, I'm going to, uh, there you go. Jim, are you still there? Oh, there they go. <laughs> they disappeared. <laughs> okay. They are back in the break. They are back in the breakout room. So we can continue some discussion. Yes, we just have to bear this anxiety of knowing just a yep. little longer. Yeah. Uh, uh, let me ask Andre, can I you ask a question? Uh, yes, of course. Go ahead. So uh What's you know what got you interested in this this aspect this this kind of debate? I just like to because uh, I it, it was very very informative to me. So you've done a great job. So just like to know what got you interested, and anyone can answer. I think like space has always fascinated me, and like I like every time I watch Star Wars, Star Trek, or any other sci-fi movie for that matter. Like, I just wish, like, humans, like, as me, I could be traveling around, across galaxies, across universes. I think that initially got me interested in space and this debate. Very good. Thank you. Anybody else? Well, in my case, I saw the debate of 2019, I think it was. And I was impressed for the ability of the people that participate there. That was motivating me. And also, I like uh, a lot about the space. And okay, what about career paths for you? Who, who, who is, not that necessarily you have to think about a space career, but are you thinking of, I'll say, what we call a STEM career, science, technology, engineering, or math? Um, I thought about going into uh, a path of technology that also requires um, in interference of space because I find both of those things really interesting. So, yeah. Very good. Thank you. Anybody else? Any questions for me? Uh, I'm a, uh, my career is in engineering. I'm a mechanical engineer by training and worked for uh, I actually interned at NASA's Kennedy Space Center when I was in college, uh, worked for Rockwell Space Transportation Systems Division on the space shuttle and worked for Northrop uh, designing fighter planes. And today I work for IEEE, the Institute for Electrical and Electronics Engineers. And one of the things I do is I try to get kids interested in pursuing careers in engineering. So anybody have any questions for me? Okay, no questions. How was the internship internship at NASA? How was it? Oh, it was the, the best summer I ever had. This was the summer of 1980. And I, while I was not working on spacecraft. I was, because I was a mechanical engineer, they put me in what was called facilities engineering design. So that was, they, that department was responsible for all of the launch facilities related to uh, operations at the Kennedy Space Center. So I had access to the launch pad. I had access to the vehicle assembly building. Uh, I got to see the Space Shuttle Columbia uh, in its uh, orbital processing facility. And if you remember the launch pad, you know, there's a big, uh, lightning rod at the top. I always got a chance to climb to the top and actually climb up the lightning rod. So uh, I mean, I realized that that was in engineering, but it was just a fun 
experience for someone who grew up with the space program to be working there uh, at NASA and with all those amazing people. So it was a pretty exciting time for me. Uh, even today, I look back on it, the most fun, exciting summer I ever had in summer of 1980. So 41 years ago, this time I was there. <laughs> Any other questions? We've got about there, they've been there about another, it's about another three minutes before this one closes out. So I don't know, hopefully they'll have figured it out by then. You guys had a very close debate, so tough job. Any other questions? Uh, it's great, again, great to see all of you and, and how well prepared you are. Uh, one of the things I will tell you, if you're interested in a career in engineering and technology, the thing you're doing today is critically important because you can be the best engineer in the world, but if you can't communicate ideas and how things work to other people, you're not going to be successful. And what you're doing today and learning about debating and being able to make a point and uh, have dialogue is critically important for when you become an engineer or a scientist. So, Keep that in mind. It's not just about the technical. It is about being able to communicate as well. Let's see. I'll remind them that they've got about two more minutes to go. OK. Just sending them a message. Uh, thank you, Bert, for sharing that. OK. That um, okay, while we wait for them. Andre, you are a returning debater. How do you feel from last year to this year? I feel that I learned a lot of stuff, but uh, I still had to learn a lot because uh, there was a change in the format. And that required me to prepare for new tasks. I also have a little different position right now from the last year, so it was still an interesting experience. Would you recommend it to others? Yes, for sure. OK, great. Let's see, about one minute to go, it's, and we'll get them back. <laughs> you, you did such a great job. They were having a tough time. Okay, raise hands. Who's who wants to go to space? <laughs> raise your hand. <laughs> okay, almost there. yeah, fabulous. <laughs> I, I I'll ask one thing out of you. If you do get that chance to go to space, you're going to invite me to the launch, right? So I can watch you launch. Okay, <laughs> I'm going to hold you to that. <laughs> and about thirty seconds to go. Any final questions, comments before we get the judges back? Okay. Let's I think see. it's uh, the latest time for Annie right now. Uh, how, what time is it there, Annie? Uh, it's already 11 p.m., but I'm okay because I usually stay up late until 12. And that was a really interesting challenge for us. We are finding a time that works for almost 11 time zones. So we really appreciate everybody compromising. And I know many people had to alter their schedules, be it for prepping with your teams or just showing up to the debate. And we really appreciate it. I close the room, they should be back in about 30 seconds. Hopefully they have had a chance to reach that conclusion. I hope so. There's Jim. Bert, it's, deja vu. it's deja vu all over again. You gotta put us back in the judging room. <laughs> it is, yes, it is that close wow we're yeah. like a point 
one way or the other. <laughs> okay, okay. <laughs> I mean, both teams did a great job. Okay, I will put you back in. Uh, We're debating for you guys. That's, uh, you should find that. <laughs> <laughs> We're yeah, quibbling so over like a point or two, so it's good. Wow. Okay, so uh, I'll put you back in for another eight minutes. Uh, if you you're won't, done, you won't need that much. You don't time. need eight. Give us, give us five, because honestly, I too have got another appointment after this, like I did uh, yesterday. You know so what? Gonna... Uh, you can, you can exit any. Uh, I don't. You can exit any time. Okay. So, so okay. Uh, let me just see if that has the clock setting here. Uh, I will put it in for five minutes. Okay. Yes, please. All right, very good. Thanks, Bert. Okay. Okay, and I'm going to open the room right now. Thank you. Okay, you're on your way. Papua, if I'm not wrong, it's probably the first time the judges have taken this much time to judge a tournament or something. Uh, yeah, I think it's taking yeah. more time than the actual debate to find the winners. <laughs> <laughs> you guys have given the judges a long, long, a long decision to make. Oh. And as Shana said, that's Well, let me tell you guys a story when I was an intern uh, at the Space Center. One of my jobs was to, and this is, you probably won't relate to this, but back in 1980, when you went to make a copy of something, like a uh, they did not have plain paper cop, you know, copiers where you just put a sheet of paper in. These were the copy machines, like they called them Xerox, had big rolls of thermal paper that you had to wind into the mechanism and then shut it. And then, of course, it would, it would cut the paper uh, as, the, as the copies came out. And one of my jobs was to replace the paper when the machine was out of paper. Now, okay, I'm an engineering student. Okay, fine. You show me the, the other intern who was leaving showed me how to do it. No, no problem. And I just thought it was funny that they had an engineering student whose job it was to replace the paper. So there were times when all of a sudden an engineer would appear in front of my desk saying the copy machines out of paper. And these were the people who got us to the moon yet they couldn't change the paper themselves. <laughs> so they needed the intern to change the paper. So I just thought that as I look back at the time, I just thought that was really funny that uh, they had to do that. Oh, you know, it was, it was uh, one of those things that you, you, you enjoy from making that, that first job. And, uh, but I, again, it, it, was, it was fun to do and I didn't mind having to do it, but I just thought it was, uh, Kind of hilarious that the engineers who got us to the moon couldn't change their couldn't change the paper in the copy machine. <laughs> uh, I just want to say that's a really cool uh, room you have there, Bert, with all oh, those yeah, modern planes. Uh, yeah, got a lot of models, uh, and uh, you can even see some up uh, up there. Wow. So I've got a, even a Starship. I've got a uh, Falcon Nine. And you might, you probably see Snoopy. I'm a big Snoopy fan. And uh, Snoopy is in his spacesuit there, but he's not on his, he's not on his doghouse. He's actually sitting, uh, I heard a couple people mention Star Trek. He's sitting on a Borg cube. So <laughs> for those Star Trek fans. But yeah, I've got a, like a big collection of space memorabilia, models, things like that, things I've done over the years. And uh, uh, there's a, a lunar module there and a space shuttle, a couple space shuttles I have. So, and the picture behind me, if you see it, that looks like a, uh, an astronaut in a spacesuit. Uh, that is actually a picture of uh, Anna Fisher. Anna Fisher was one of the original female astronauts. And that's an iconic photo of her when she was modeling a spacesuit. She helped develop the spacesuits. And it became a very famous photo. But what's fun about the story is when I was working at Northrop, uh, 
I ended up working with her brother and her brother was an engineer at Northrop. And he basically told people his sister worked at NASA. That's how he described his sister who was an astronaut. She worked at NASA. So, so everyone, you know, a lot of people work at NASA, but I had a chance to arrange several meetings with her. She came out, I'm part of the American Society of Mechanical Engineers. So she's from Southern California. So she came out to talk to our group and I've got a chance to be, you know, become friends with her. So I was always a big fan and she retired uh, back in 2017 after a very long career as an astronaut. And she was appearing at the Kennedy Space Center. And I went down to see her and uh, uh, just reminded her that uh, of the meetings we, we had when she came to visit. So uh, really nice experience. I'm gonna close the room. Okay, so we should get our-, our... Has it been eight minutes already? Uh, I wait, they only wanted five. So, so, but they've done eight, eight and five you know that's 21 minutes <laughs> yeah <laughs> we'll have to give them a hard time okay <laughs> that's see. almost half of what the students debated them yes so. uh, uh, amazing that's it's actually when you think about it it's 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 more than that because there's an extra minute on it's eight minutes then when you close the room it adds an extra minute so so they'll actually have done this for about 24 minutes of, de of debate. There they are. We're Ooh. back. We were just counting Ooh, up the time. Tough. That was tough, friend. <laughs> Listen, I know you've been waiting a long time, so we're going to just kind of tell you how our decision went down so that you can understand why it took so long. Um, if you've ever read any you know, or watched trials take place, right, when the jury is convening, if there's a long decision, it's because both sides feel very strongly um, about, about particular issues. And uh, for that reason, both of us felt, you know, we came out, our numbers were so close. Not only were our numbers close individually ranking the teams, but between um, my, my counterpart here, Jim, and, and my scores, it was within like one point difference. So it's really, that's why it was so hard for us. And it was funny because he's like on the one side and I'm kind of coming from the other side. So we just want you to know that honestly, we were kind of like, we were like, well, we could just tell them it's a tie and let them figure it out. But we know we can't do that. So, so Jim was gracious enough to allow me to announce the winner, um, but I want to explain overall um, some thoughts first and Jim, please chime in. First of all, we, we both felt that obviously presentation wise, it was a pretty equal match. There are some, you have some really good, strong speakers on each team and you have a few who could use some improvement on both sides as well, which kind of balanced it out. And here's what I would say to those speakers, please try to not read from your script quite as much. It's really important in a presentation, even though you're reading from your screen, to establish eye contact with your, re your listeners so that they feel connected to you in some way. I would also recommend that under cross-examination, that you be very, very passionate about your answers and make sure you're attacking what they're saying. There should be clash. And so by that, what I mean is that while you're still supposed to be polite, you should be pointing out if they didn't address your contentions. And, and um, Jim felt, Mr. Plasco, I'm sorry, Mr. Plasco felt strongly, and he's right, that, there, that the contention brought up by the negation side uh, about it being kind of an unbalanced representation or ratio when it comes to uh, how the, the UN Security Council would make a decision was not really effectively refuted by the pro side. They did refute it. It was just a question of whether or not it could have been done better. So I would recommend throwing words into your defenses, such as the impact of this. This is important because if you can connect that emotionally to your listeners to understand the impact of using what it seems to be a one-sided counsel versus, hey, at least it's better than nothing, right? Because that seemed to be what your response was. We have nothing else. So we have to start with someone. And so far, this group seems to have the most um, overarching. All right, without further ado, and again, we, we just felt like you both should go on, but we're going to award this one to the affirmative by such a small fighting hair that, <laughs> all right. Anything you want to say, Jim? Uh, I, I would just like to reinforce uh, the various points uh, that you made with respect to uh, both presentation uh, and uh, dealing with the points and counterpoints that each team made. 
So, and I want to say good luck to both teams uh, with your future debates. One more point I want to make about universalization. I feel like I've hammered this in every single one. This was the first one that I've heard where people actually defined universalization going in. And that as a debate coach was important to me. A lot of you all are defining key terms in this particular resolution. Both of you should have defined the word should. I know it seems like a small word, but depending upon what side you're on, that word should can be a much more it's a forceful requirement versus a simple suggestion. And when you're looking at definitions, how you spin them can really matter. But I wanna really commend, um, I heard that the pro side mentioned Dr. Edmonds definition particularly of universalization. Whereas I felt that on the negation side, you could have done a better job of explaining that and tying each one of your um, impacts back. And I just wanna share that with you because having coached before that universalization aspect of this debate is particularly important. All right. Now I'm done. Sorry to take all your time, friends. Um, thank you, judges. Great and great, excellent job, everyone. Thank you for participating in 2021's Fun Debate Tournament for Room 10. The debate program would not be possible without the student debaters, coaches, hosts, and moderators. Many, many thanks to the students and coaches. Please consult the tournament bracket for your next room. The coaches will provide you with the next debate positions as soon as possible. Judges, could you please remain in the room for reporting purposes? Goodbye, everyone. Uh, Thank, we you will for the class. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Uh, That's hard in debate <laughs> Okay. Uh, our Let's guest, do we need the guest here? There we go. Yep. Okay. Yeah. That's it. Uh, if we could stop recording. I will do that right now. <laughs>